So at this time, children in worship are dismissed. That's ages three to five years old. Your leaders will meet you in the back. And the rest of us are going to hang out here for a while, and we're going to unpack the story of David and Bathsheba. And uh, yes, we're going to deal with the issue of sin today, and very well worded about our own selfish desires. And so it's possible in this message today, you're going to feel a little conviction, because on this side of heaven, none of us are perfect, and we still have things we stumble and fall over. Open your Bibles with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 27, but we're going to read them in sections, so we're not going to stand today as we usually do in honor of God's Word. Instead, I'm going to take each section at a time, so you'll be able to remain seated. We've been following along the story of David, and it's in a way, a little ironic, last week, if you were here or listened online, by the way, welcome all those on Facebook today. We usually have about 8 to 10 people watching live on Facebook, and then throughout the week, we could have up to 60 or 70 people watch our services. So, it's really pretty cool. New tool, way of getting uh, information out there. So, thank you for joining us today. Hello to those of you out in California who have been consistently joining in with us. But open your Bibles to 2 Samuel 11 as we unpack this story. If you've got your phone, get your phone app out. I want you to see this section of Scripture. And if not, there's a Bible there right in front of you, and you can look at page 304. This is going to be one of the saddest chapters in the life of King David in so many different ways. But it's also the most real chapter in David's life. Because it's something he engages in. It's something where temptation overpowers him. And we're going to unpack and learn, even for ourselves, how does temptation still affect us, even though we're adamant in our walk with Christ, even though we're adamant in pursuing him every day. Remember that David is a man after God's own heart. He was on the crescendo of his life and his relationship and his role as king over Israel. And our chapter, as we begin to see here, is the beginning of the end. And thank you, Jack, for that wonderful picture he took for me. He says, now you can know who these sheep belong to. It's such, isn't that a beautiful shot? Oh, man. The beginning of the end. And as we look at this story, we open it to the first three verses where it says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Now you have to remember what's happening here, okay? This is, it says it's in the springtime, and often what that meant was because of the winter and the, the weather, much like you guys who are in agriculture, no, you can't work the field. And so it would often wait until early spring or later spring when the ground was a little drier, some of the crops are starting to come, and then they would be able to get food as they're going out on a military uh, excursion. And as you remember, for those of you who have been here, David was the king, and the king is supposed to lead the army. He's supposed to lead the military. If you remember, people were saying, we want a king who will go out and fight for us. So already we see a problem for David, and that is he's not doing what he was supposed to be doing. In fact, it says that he remained in Jerusalem, and then one evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. Not only was he not doing what God had, would have him do in his role as king, but he sent others on, and he remained back. And it says one evening, some translations say one afternoon. Okay, so he's just lazing around. I mean, this is one of those... Now, I do this, actually. I'm taking a nap before I go to bed. Have you ever done that? <laughs> right? It's like 7 o'clock and you take a nap, you know, and then later you go to bed. This is what's happening. So he's idle. He's distracted. He's not living his life on purpose. Instead, he's just kind of meandering around. And look what it says. So from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman 
was very beautiful. Doesn't say she was pretty. Doesn't say she was beautiful. It says she was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. Okay, so here he is in his idleness. Here he is just, and he happens to notice a woman, a very beautiful woman off bathing. Because see, the palace is probably elevated quite a bit from where some of the other residents and homes and stuff. We don't know a lot about what Bathsheba was doing there and where she was living. But she, we do know that David saw her and he went to inquire of her. So see how the temptation is starting to build. Not only did he look, not only was he idle, and then he started looking around, but his imagination started running. Who is that? I want to know more about her. You see, here's what I want you to know. As a man, God has created us visually to be stimulated. And, and so we can't frown on him for that. The temptation comes, and as men, that temptation, it's what you do with the temptation that makes all the difference. What David should have done here right away was went, whoa, and turn the page. Click off the screen. Go the other way. Ask God to purify, right? To change of direction. But he momentarily entertained and to the level of, who is that? I want to know. And so he sends a messenger. And then, watch this messenger. He comes back and he tells David, her name is Bathsheba. The daughter of Elam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. I mean, this, this messenger, it's possible that he was like, dude, you want to stay away from this, but I, you're the king. I can't tell you that. So let me just give you these three warnings. She has a name, and it's Bathsheba. She has a father. She's a, she's a daughter of somebody. And not only that, is she, but she's married. She's a married woman. That right there should have told David, Hands off, right? He's the king. And so his imagination comes. His information grows. Because see, David knew that he was not to commit adultery. He knew that. And if she's a, a married woman, he knew to stay away from her. Well, what happens? So in temptation... See how that happened? The idleness created the opportunity. Instead of looking away, he engaged. He, the imagination started running. His desire started birthing itself. He found out about her. And then he wants even more. Because he's already, his brain, his mind has already gone off. And then he knows who Uriah is. It's one of his courageous battlemen. We see other places where Uriah is leading and he's a champion warrior. So the self-respect or the respect for Uriah should have been there as well. See how temptation has its way? So let me talk a little bit about seduction. Because this right here we see, right, the conceiving of it. The conceiving of how that happened for David. And this is the lesson I think God wants us to learn because we're not immune. We have the seduction of comfort in our life today. And entitlement. So we think about our lives today and we see in scripture where Jesus said, Take up your cross one time and follow me and then it's over. That's not what he said, did he? He said, take up your cross Daily. Every day. But see, in our lives of comfort, we think, oh, well, taking up my cross is like getting a bad parking space at Best Buy. I had to walk clear from the canyon rim to get to Best Buy. It's terrible. Right? What, what are we sacrificing for Christ as we live our lives? With comfort in our culture today, don't we want the best of everything? And don't we have the best of everything? Don't we trade in things so that we can have the best? But Christ said, take up my cross daily. One of our values here at New Life is that we see people who are not living with the best of everything on purpose. They're saying, hey, I have the means, but you know what? I'm not going to live that lifestyle where I have to have the best, the newest, the greatest. I am sacrificially 
in my life relationship with Christ, putting that aside so that I could bless something else, so that I could use the blessings financially, time-wise, whatever, to be sacrificial and give in another place, in another way. Thank you for doing that. But see how seduction comes or entitlement. I work so hard, I deserve it. You know, Christ, I give up so much for you. I need this pleasure or I need, I'm entitled to it. Look at all that I've done. I mean, entitlement says I should have this because I've done that. It's a very works-based thinking and idea. Let's go back to our scripture because now we come into the whole committing And there's only a couple of verses. Then David sent messengers to get her. Watch how there's just bullets right out. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. And then she went back home. And the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I'm pregnant. So David went and sent messengers to go and get her. And I think in this story, we always focus on David. But I want you to think of the other ones that are involved, the messengers. They know what's going on. And they're looking at this situation, following the king's orders. Bathsheba. We think of our women here that are sitting here today as a woman. And somebody calls and says, hey, come on up. Come on up to the palace. I want you to, I want to visit. What was she thinking? Could she have said no? Perhaps. But would she have been punished for that? Could her husband have been punished for that? If she was to say no? Perhaps she thought, maybe I can find out some information about my husband. He's on the front lines. I'd love to hear what's happening. Maybe she was longing for the embrace of community, of fellowship, of connecting with somebody. So she puts that aside. Maybe she just wanted a baby and she thought, I will serve this way. I'll I'll, I'll have a child for the king. We don't know. It doesn't tell us. We We don't know what all goes on in Bathsheba's mind. But here's one thing we do know. That no Jewish citizen had to obey the king who was disobeying God. Because that's what's happening here. David is disobeying the Lord and his covenant with God. And the law that he was told to live by and to submit to. And and it's so easy to look at David and say, he's weak. Well, let's step out of this story and consider your own story. Think back this last week. Think back this last month. Think back this last year. The seduction of pleasure. Pleasure is that temptation to escape. Life throws you a curveball. What do you do? Things aren't going well at home. You're in conflict. What do you do? The stress is just so heavy. What do you do? Where do you escape to? What are you using to escape? Another person? Pleasure? Internet pornography? What? what, Alcohol? Recreational drugs? What are you doing when these things come on? And to see how easily that seduction of pleasure, where, you, where do you run to when you want to escape? And then greed, it so, it's so often shows itself as a drive for more, right? And, and in our culture today, we often applaud that. Hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm just kind of sitting around. I took a nap this afternoon. It was really good. I don't have a lot to do. I'm just being idle on the palace rooftop. We don't like that. Instead, we say, busy, man. I am so busy. 
right? You never say, I'm, I'm idle, I don't have anything to do. <laughs> it's always, we're busy. But what is driving that busyness in your life? If you always have a desire for more, I would encourage you to consider what it is even at a deeper level. Because greed also shows up in the desire to present yourself as successful. I have a reputation to hold up, to keep, right? So where do you see yourself? See, David and Bathsheba sinned against God in this story. Did you catch that line, she was purifying herself? That was a religious action following menstrual cycles. And women were in that time told to purify through a bath, a ritualistic religious ceremony. She was a religious Jewish woman. So she, too, is sinning against God in this story. The one who designed marriage, the one who wrote the rules for marriage in a covenantal relationship. So serious was this issue of adultery in the Old Testament that it was said they are to be put to death. That's how serious it is. That's how great an offense it is in front of God. But what do we do here in our society? Obviously, we probably wouldn't want to call for the death penalty. But it's a very serious thing that we just blow by. Right? We, we try to cover it up. Or, well, people are people. They have needs. But as Christ followers, this whole seduction of pleasure... And greed, when brides and grooms make vows to themselves, the biggest thing, and this is what I tell new couples, is it's a covenant in front of God. See, it's a threesome in the most healthy way. But let's go on, because in the story of David, we see now the covering Right? And we start with just looking at verse 5. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Bathsheba finally speaks. It's the only words we hear from her. And David was shattered to hear it. The consequence of what has happened. And now she is pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. Send me let him come. I want him here. Words Bathsheba says David didn't want to hear, but now we begin to see this corruption and even a deception as he seeks to deceive. Watch what happens. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Job was and how the soldiers were and how the war was going. Remember, he came from the front lines. And then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. This is a ceremonial thing again, a purification. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. And so he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Watch what Uriah says to David. The ark, remember that's the representation of the presence of God. The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander Job and my Lord's men are encamped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Can you see the irony and the contrast? And what Uriah was doing, that's what David was supposed to be doing. And here's Uriah doing it. David sets it up. Plan A, go home and sleep with your wife. Then when she says, I'm pregnant, it'll look right. But Uriah is a man of integrity. And he says, I'm not going to do that. So then, what does David say? Stay here one more day. And tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that, next, that day and the next. Now watch verse 13. Plan B. And David's invitation, he ate and he drank with him. 
David made him drunk. In other words, if I, if I get him intoxicated, he won't be such a man of integrity, and he'll go, and he'll sleep with his wife, right? But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants, and he didn't go home. This covering, David knows he's in trouble. He should have just stopped right there and admitted his guilt, right? Because as, as Christ followers, we know that. Confess your sins before God and he will forgive you and heal you, right? In conflict with people, we're supposed to look at the log in our own eye before we start picking at the speck in others, right? Self-examination, self-reflection. But here is Uriah, a man of integrity, and he says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go sleep with my wife. But let's go on. Verses 14 through 21. Let's see what happens here and the death and destruction that follows in our story. Verse 14. So in the morning, David wrote a letter to Job and sent it with Uriah. Now catch that. Okay, David's writing a letter to the chief officer in the army or the military. And he gives it to Uriah to take it to him. Okay? In it, he wrote, watch these words, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. That's pretty bold. Because why wouldn't Uriah open it up and read it? <laughs> right? Because David knew how trustworthy he was. It probably had the king's seal on it. And so here, Uriah is going to bring a letter to Job, the front of the military campaign, that's his own death certificate. But his integrity is maintained in that. Let's, let's read on. So while Job had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. And when the men of the city came out and fought against Job, some of the men in David's army fell. So we're not just talking about Uriah. Don't miss that. The consequence of David's sin goes big, big to, the, to his own men. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Job sent David a full account of the battle, and he instructed the messenger, when you finish giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up, and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Don't you know the shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerobethus? Didn't a woman drop up a milestone from him on the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. Because, see, that's what David wanted to happen. That's what he asked to happen. And so if he starts asking all these other questions and gets upset, Job says to his servant, just tell him, Uriah is dead. So then we go on, verses 22 through 27. So the messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Job had sent him to say. And the messenger said to David, The men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. See, now he's telling the king, Some of your soldiers are dead. They died in this military campaign. Moreover, here's the line Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. Now watch what David says. David told the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Do you see what sin has done to him? He's totally lost sensitivity. All he can think of is Uriah the Hittite is dead. It doesn't matter that others were destroyed in the process. His conscience it's like not even there. Don't let this upset you. Have you ever seen a military commander at the loss of their men? It upsets them. Their brothers, their sisters, their family, they watch each other's back. Don't let this upset you, David says. 
Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Job. Now when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned. She mourned for him. And then after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. See, no matter what David might be thinking here as as how he covered it up and, and all the people that it affected and the destruction and the death that happened, David may think he's getting away with something. He's doing an honorable thing by marrying Bathsheba. But the eyes of Yahweh are always open. And he may have covered it up from others, but he didn't cover it up from his Lord, the God he was in covenant with whose eyes see everything. And it says, God was displeased. The Lord was displeased with David. Therein is the heart of what Susan was telling children in a simple way of an ice cream sundae with a worm in it. No matter how much you cover up that worm, a worm is still a worm. And no matter how much we try to cover up our sin, Sin is still sin, and it's an offense to God. We can't be in denial. And I think that's part of what what David was seeing here. He's more interested in the morale of his troops than the moral decline that's happening within his own heart. And that's where we see this seduction of deception. David was breaking the Ten Commandments one by one. He coveted his neighbor's wife. He committed adultery. And now he's telling false things and bearing false witness against his neighbor. And he even ordered him to be killed. How far down the road he went. But he's not going to escape God's judgment. And there's a proverb that's for us. It says, he who covers his sins will never prosper. Amen. Have a good week. We'll see you when you get back next week, Lord willing. I really thought about ending it there. I really did. Because I thought, okay, that's pretty dramatic. (laughs) And what David did was displeasing to the Lord. But I couldn't do that. Because we have the cross. And every week, at some point, I'm going to point to it. I'm going to speak to it. I've told our leadership, if I don't speak about the cross of Christ, tell me to get off the stage. Amen? Because that's the hope. You see how depressing the story is and what we could be left with. But here's the joy and that your life is designed by God and he has so much more. It's not that God is just displeased. He sings over us because of the cross. And so every week I want to point at some time to the cross of Christ and God's insatiable love for you. His driving passion. No matter how many steps you may walk away. No matter how far that seduction you may go. It's only one step back with God. Oh, you may have the consequences of your sin, of your disobedience, of the broken relationships, of the broken inwardness that causes and happens out of that. But I'm telling you, our God is a God of restoration and new life and new design. Our whole church is based on that. New life, community, church. You see, the the old can still be there and remnants of it can still be there, but it's not what defines you. My past is my past. And out of that, I can, by God's power and presence, make changes for the future. But I don't identify with that. I'm a drunk. I'm a thief. I'm a liar. I'm engaged in pornography. That's who I am. No, that's who I was. But by God's grace and God's power, I am now walking in power and strength. And oh, I may stumble. I still have this sinful nature in me. 
but I don't cover it up. I don't deny it. I don't hide it. Instead, I fall on my knees. That's what, could you imagine? What if David would have went to the tent of meeting with God and fell on his knees, got on his face, and said, I've sinned. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against Uriah, Bathsheba. God, save me. Help me. Restore me. How do I put this back together again? I want to be the man that you called me to be. I want to follow through on who I am in you, God. I'm the king of Israel. So how about us? What do we grab a hold of? What do we hold on to when we mess up? See, I couldn't just send you out the door feeling convicted. Instead, I want to say, your life is in God's design. And the really, truly glorious one is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. All this other stuff is here today and gone tomorrow. Right? Jesus is truly the glorious one. In Philippians, it says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I want you to think about that as you go out of this place. Does Jesus hold that place in your life? He's the most important thing ever. This last week, did it display itself? This last month? This last year? Pursue him. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counted it all as garbage so I could gain Christ and become one with him. Jesus is truly the most glorious one. But Jesus has given us righteousness to me. See, it's not you have to earn it. You don't have to deserve it. It's not something you can accomplish. It's not something I'll make God love me more. That's the, the false teaching of works-based faith. Instead, we live on grace-based faith. It's not what I do. It's what Christ has already done. And so we live in that. That's my identity. That's who I am. I don't have to earn God's love. I already have it for the sake of the cross. How much more love? Jesus said, a good, you might die for a good man, but while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's not a works-based faith. It's grace-based faith. I no longer count my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. God, give me the faith to live that out each and every day. That Jesus has given his righteousness to me. See, my own self-earned, it don't stand for nothing. It's filthy rags, the Bible calls it. The best I could possibly do on my own is still but filthy rags. But God gives me a new jacket, a new suit, some new clothes to put on. And it's the righteousness of Christ. Jesus is sufficient for all my needs. And this is where it really catches. This is where the rubber hits the road so they see, you know. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him. Can we say that? I want to suffer with him. Sharing in his death so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Jesus is sufficient for all my needs. If I have Jesus, I'm rich beyond compare. Right? I have everything. In him. I don't need anything to complete me. I don't need that other relationship. I don't need another person. I have Jesus. I don't need a new bass boat. Sure, it'd be nice, but I don't need it. <laughs> right? I, I don't need all that stuff. I have Jesus. So how do we do that? Because it's one thing to... I'm sure you're all, I even got some amens today. Thanks by that way on that. It's one thing to believe it. It's another to live it out, isn't it? I mean, that, that is so true. We come in here week after week and we get these truths and then we, we go, man, yeah. And then we go out there and oops, you know, it's like, okay, 
So what, how, how do we do it? Well, you have to revisit them over and over and over. What are you filling your mind with? You know the old story, garbage in, garbage out? Put God's word in and you'll have God's word flow out. So take a daily inventory. This is, this is a real simple thing to do. As, in, in fact, in Celebrate Recovery, we call it a daily moral inventory. Simply revisit the last 24 hours of your life and record both the positive and the negative attitudes. I mean, think about your relationships or things that are troubling your mind or deep in your heart. Look beyond the offenses caused by others and examine your own reactions expressed due to someone else's behavior. Now, I just did this. And, and I had to ask myself, why did I react that way in this situation, I was with a group of godly men, and we were talking about uh, congregational vitality pathway. And it's one of my passions is to help churches get back on track, get back on mission. Don't close your doors. Let's see what God still has for you in the place where he planted you on his mission post there. And as we're talking about that and the process of it, one of the, the folks said, so when it comes to follow-up and it comes to connecting with the churches on a regular basis, we really don't do anything, do we? And he's talking about us as a region. And out of my mouth comes, wait, wait, wait. Yes, we do. And I went on a line-by-line line of what I do. In connecting with the churches. And I even said, I don't mean to come across defensively. <laughs> so do you see that you stop and you evaluate and you go back, why did I do that? And because it's not going to change if I don't, right? It, I, I'm just going to flip into that mindset again and it's going to happen. So I did my own personal reflection. What I came away with is I'm, see, in Celebrate Recovery, we introduce ourselves and then we say what we struggle with. And my name's Gary, and I struggle with people pleasing. And I also drink alcohol sometimes for the wrong reasons. That's my line. And I'm honest about that. Now, there was no alcohol at this event, so it had to be the other one, right? <laughs> people pleasing. My image, what I present, all the hard work I did. All the work in this past year I've done with churches and connecting. And this man says, so we're really not doing anything. It's pretty defensive to come back emotionally impacted. Hey, hang on a second. Instead, I have a pretty good sense of humor. I should have wrote it off humor, with humor, right? Like, well, I guess there's no need for me to work you know, this round then next year or something. You know, I could have said something different. But see what stirs in? Here's the thing. When we come to that, now that's a change I'm looking for in my life, and I've wrestled with it for a long time. But here's the bottom line. I just have to win today. Right? So, so at the end of the day, when I'm taking that moral inventory, I just have to win today and say, God, wow, there was that situation, and, I, and you helped me through it. You gave me the power, the ability to turn from that and do something different. I'm thanking you for that. And if I focus on today, it's going to help me in winning my tomorrows. I can't change yesterday. I can't go back and change what happened in that situation. But I can, I can say that doesn't define me. What defines me is my relationship with Christ. Jesus truly is the glorious one. Jesus truly has given his righteousness to me. And in Jesus Christ, I'm self-sufficient. It doesn't matter to me if they think I'm doing my job or not, does it? Especially somebody new coming in. I don't have to defend myself. I have the greatest defender ever. Jesus. And he defended me against the most serious of all things, eternal hell. And he's given me his righteousness and his life. I hope you walk out of here now with better than convicted, but in rejoicing. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for showing us that no matter where we are in life, how society looks at us, whether we're in poverty or riches, whether we're prosperous or we're facing challenges and difficulties, help us to see that if we see your son and we take pride in what he is to us, that that's the thing that cuts us off from the power of sin within this human flesh. 
and moves us on to the crown of life. Would that we all have that. Would that everybody in this room, those listening online, those who catch us a little bit later, would know and get that. We pray this in our precious Savior's name, Jesus. Amen.